now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, everyone. You are listening or watching, and now for something completely machinima, a podcast and video devoted to machinima and related real-time technologies. I'm Ricky Grove, your host today. I'm here with Tracy Harwood, Phil Rice, and Damian Valentine, as usual, my uh, normal evil cohorts. Now, today, we're looking at Phil Rice's pick, and boy, is it a doozy. I'm really excited to see what people have to say about this one. It's called, I Put Four Million Suns in a Black Hole Over New York. Now, the title of that is worth an award in itself. It's created by a uh, person who calls himself Epic Spaceman. And in addition to the this short film, um, he also has a, in, Phil has included a another film about the background of, of uh, Epic Spaceman and who he is. So we'll be discussing those two right off the bat. Phil, take it away. Yeah, I confess when I when the title for this film came up in my thanks to the algorithm on YouTube, I just assumed that it was either a Grace Till Plays video or uh, what's the other person? Uh, Let's Game It Out. One of these satirical, uh, absurdist <laughs> takes on a video game environment, um, you know, something like, you know, I built a of. 150 mile hallway for the sims and then put them in there to die and that kind of thing so i assumed it was that and clicked on it thinking it was that i got something very very different yes indeed and, uh and a very very pleasant surprise uh essentially uh this film uh made by a solo creator and yeah he goes on youtube by the name epic spaceman um, the reason i included the that will include the link to the who is epic spaceman video is because he he tells his story, who he is, why he's making the videos that he did, how he learned to make the videos that he did. Um, but he makes this, uh, he made this film in Blender, and this is the type of film that he makes. And I want to say at the time of, of this release, he has no more than half a dozen videos on his channel that he's produced over a period of a year or more. So he's a high effort low volume output creator and it really works for him uh, he's he's not just putting quick videos out um these are uh epic scale productions and it seems like the, the the theme across all of them which he's chosen as kind of his mission if you will is these are aerospace educational videos videos about you know, you figure if if you could take a chapter out of, you know, a Stephen Hawking book and turn it into something entertaining and interesting, that seems like what he's trying to do. So it's not simple topics at all. It's topics like black holes and how the the mass supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and how they are formed and how they interact it's basically everything we know about those things a lot of it's theoretical of course still <clears throat> but this is it, it's a representation of what we do know about them and helping to get a sense of of the scale of things in the in in the case of this particular video uh, and so he sets the video over a landscape of manhattan and you know our earth is a certain size and our sun is a certain size and then he goes up in scale from there, using Blender to give this otherworldly and, you know, frankly, something that would be impossible to do with traditional filmmaking. Um, this is where, you know, CGI does what it does best, right? So um, it's just amazingly done. Um, it feels authentic. I, I 
I confess, I don't have an engineering degree, so I don't know that I could properly fact check what he's presenting here, but it seems sound. It seems very solid. It does seem like he actually really does know what he's talking about. And then to find that he's a self-taught Blender user, uh, about that he, he began learning Blender about three or four years ago and learned most of what we see here in a year, <clears throat> which is amazing. I mean, he knew nothing. He wasn't like someone who was involved with Machinima or virtual production some other way and then decided to up his game. He knew nothing. At least that's what he says. And uh, taught himself, uh, you know, using available resources online, um, how to do this. And the result is amazing. I mean, this is this is several people in the comments of the video state this as well, and I agree. This could be if you saw this production on one of the science television channels or produced by some large, you know, by Discovery or some some big company like that that's into on the History Channel. This is better than anything I've ever seen on the History Channel, frankly. They're, they're not really necessarily the most realistic ones, but some of the science stuff, I mean, this this pro quality, and I don't just mean that as a as just a compliment. It really is um, exceptionally good quality. Um, he puts himself in the video. Um, it seems like that that that's something he's going to do in a space suit, but it's actually him, a vir you know, virtual avatar of him. So he can narrate. Uh, that's an interesting choice to me because in choosing to do that, he made he made the production harder. Like it must have really meant something to him to have an actual physical embodiment of a narrator there because a sci-fi, a, a science documentary is very often just narrated by Morgan Freeman right. or Idris Elba or somebody, right? And it's yeah. just you just hear their voice <clears throat> and see the images. Third no, person. he actually wanted it to be more personal than that, more of a connection. Uh, and I think also maybe some of that is marketing savvy, that he wanted to make a personal connection with his audience, to not just have it be just pretty videos, but... Uh, he wanted you to remember that it was him. Um, I think that's very smart. I mean, there may be personal reasons behind that too, that he really wants that connection himself, but it's also very smart marketing um, because it's it's it makes the video undeniably his. It will make his videos instantly recognizable. Um, even if you happened to see it without noticing who it was from, you know, there's there's going to be that recognizability. That was very very smart. So, I just loved this. I I had no idea that he was out there. Um, the self taught uh, solo filmmaker mm -hmm. story is very inspirational to me. Um, it's you know now mind you, he's got a brain clearly because he's got an engineering degree. I think an, an aerospace engineering degree. So he's a very smart dude. But still, the fact that anybody could in a year go from zero to hero in Blender is pretty remarkable. Um, and, and he it, mentions it he has encouraging. A, he mentions he has a family. Yeah. Yeah, he's not doing this as a full-time job, I don't <clears> think. <throat> or he didn't when he, when he started. He was still working, if I remember right from his story. So, yeah, he's juggling this in the way that almost all of us are that are in this, you know, that it's it's the thing we do after we've put our food on the table. So right. yeah, that was just so encouraging and inspiring. And, uh, and then on top of that, it's just a beautifully done video. So um, yeah, that's my take on it. What did you guys think? Oh, Tracy? Wow. Yeah. Wow. We want to hear you. What the digging you've been doing on the I, background of this. I, I have done a bit, <laughs> as you can imagine, but I've got to say, good grief. What an amazing presentation style this guy's got. His real name is Toby Lockerbie. Um, he's, you know, he's clearly got uh, a, such a compelling way, actually, of, of talking about astrophysics, basically. Um, he's got the aura of a scientist off to a T. Um, I, I wasn't thinking, you know, narrator 
uh, Morgan Freeman and what have you. I was thinking a David Attenborough stroke Carl Sagan stroke. Yeah. I don't know. Steve oh, Martin. Carl Sagan is perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know he's he's his it's his his it's basically his style. His, you know he's, he's got this kind of patient approach to storytelling about science where details matter. Um, but nothing about the detail can really be told unless you tell it through metaphor, um, simply because we just don't have the experience right, in, right. In, on, on which to bootstrap ourselves as lay consumers of this kind of science. So he's found a way, and that's what I mean by him being so compelling, he's found a way to communicate with us through metaphors that kind of make, make sense. I mean, that's very clever to, to have done that. And as you said, Phil, he's got tens of thousands of followers who are evidently looking at this from from. Well, I was asking, you know, from what kind of perspective would they be looking at it? From a home homeschooling perspective, a personal learning perspective. I'm not sure, but I, you know, maybe even educators as uh, would would be looking at this as kind of supplementary materials um, as well. I would have thought um, his rationale for doing these is is something that. That kind of shines through. He's passionate about getting the details as accurate as possible. Um, but I'm not too sure of his scientific credentials, in fact, um, because in his overview video, he says he's not an astrophysicist, but an engineer by training. And he's a photographer by trade. Um, and, you know, um, well, I think the engineer side is is totally what I can see in the way that he conveys this kind of attention to detail, showing the connectivity uh, between things. Isn't that what engineers are, are just brilliant at doing? Mm -hmm. and, and and the photography side of things, the visual storytelling. Well, it, it's it's not really that surprising actually when I learned that in 2016 he was recognised by Sony Europe as an independent certified expert in filmmaking. Uh, and appeared on their Sony Pro show. And and prior to that, a documentary he made about his approach to filmmaking was a staff pick on Vimeo in 2013. So he's he's clearly not without chops in terms of filmmaking. And I think that mm -hmm. comes through as well. Yes. He did actually say in his video that um, it was indeed Carl Sagan that had inspired him, as well as St Stephen Hawking. But he also mentioned Bill Bryson, um, and some other YouTube channels, scientific YouTube channels and kids shows, all basically um, finding novel ways to tell incredible science stories. So I think that's what he's trying to emulate in, in what he's he's doing here. I think what's fascinating about him is that before he started making these videos, he had no prior experience, as you said, of using Blender, but also no audience um, for the content that he wanted to make, which I think... You know, that's that's fascinating how he's basically, you know, learned a new suite of, of, of tools. Um, but but interesting what, what I what I picked up on when he, when he was talking about it is that he's not um, you know, he didn't sort of carry through a whole bunch of tutorials and then try to to uh, apply all of that to his filmmaking. He kind of got a little bit of the way through and then thought, you know what? I'm and just then decided do... to start working on it. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's what I call just in time learning. He needs yeah. what he needs to know to to do what he wants to do, which is which is um, which is fantastic. Um, I think what comes through really strongly with this is his visual storytelling skills, and that would have been honed over a lot longer than you know the, the three or four years that he's been trying to learn. Right, or two or three years that he's been trying to learn Blender. Um, I, you know, it's it it's it, I guess really that kind of approach to you know, picking up something and just using it off bat because, you know, he also talks about using a Rococo, um, you know, cheap end, whatever that would be kind of, uh, you know, end of the end of the scale on the, on the mocap suit and all that sort of stuff. So he's, he's picking and choosing what he wants. And isn't that really what machinima creators are great at? You know, the, 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 it's something we've kind of commented on many times over the years. They just pick up tools and just use them for whatever story it is they kind of want to tell. Um, but I think what's what comes through here is his ability to capture an audience. Um, and I think those channel numbers just speak for themselves. He's clearly tapping into something pretty big here, or or at least ways there's a, a you know, there's a there's a demand here for this kind of content that just isn't being filled by uh other forms of media. Um and he's clearly 
you know, tapping into it. He's, he's in the millions with his views. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, with with just, well, I'd say no experience, but you know, clearly he's he's made uh, quite astonishing adverts. Actually, when you look on his own channel, he's he's not he's not an ungifted filmmaker at all, and he does quite a lot of that, uh, making advertisements for big brands. Um, so yeah, I think I think his biggest challenge really is um, discovery on on a platform that's you know, far from good at doing discovery, which is basically, you know, the biggest bane of every YouTuber's um, life, I think. Um, but, you know, he's he's done it amazingly well. He's making great content. It's got really good production values. I think he's clearly doing it with relatively little money. Um, just this kind of passion and, and interest in sharing his, um, you know, thoughts uh, with others. Um, I guess the the bit that frustrated me, and this might be because he's perhaps not so experienced at the YouTube phenomenon, but you sent us that how uh, who he is kind of to um, video as well. And the thing that frustrated me the most of, with that one is it took me nearly almost five full minutes of adverts to get to that video. I mean, that was huh. just stupid. I don't know whether it's you know something that we we. We have it that's different here in the UK, but I could not believe it has to be different because that didn't happen to me at all. Did I, it not? Nearly no, five yeah, years. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> as a YouTube creator, I could tell you that, like, when they, when, when you're, uh, whatever the, the term is, when you can actually have ads run on your channel, they tell you how it works. And basically, there's a, there's a pretty hard limit on how much pre roll ads can run. Um, for a for a video that's got monetization turned on, and it's nowhere near five minutes. I mean, it's yeah. well, it definitely I think there's was one fixed length and one variable length that can be skipped, and that's it. Yeah. So and yeah, that's ads, interesting. The ads yeah. have to be thirty seconds or shorter as well. So right. That must have been a glitch. Well, yeah, that's, five, nearly that's very five full minutes. I couldn't couldn't believe it. I nearly just wow. gave up on it. It was just astonishing. If, if but, man, you, know, can't, you can't escape glitching, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Evidently not. But if I mean, overall, again. I thought it was a really, really interesting, in, interesting pick. I love the way he put him in, in the um, in the scene as well. A very, very well thought through marketing strategy for sure. Because I think this is really going places. I don't know where exactly, but yeah, good, really good. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Uh, I was. Uh fascinated by this video and obviously i'm very just in space um for my love of science fiction i like to know how you know what really works and what really goes on out there um i'm nowhere near as knowledgeable as uh, epic space man is but the things that he talked about that i recognized they, they were spot on so i'd say he definitely knows his stuff and he's put a lot of time into um researching to make sure that uh, everything he's talking about lines up with uh, scientific facts and theories um this is the kind of video that we don't see very often uh, with machinima because uh, it's usually some kind of storytelling, whereas this is educational. And he's presenting it in a very cinematic way, but it's done in a way that makes it... He's got these really difficult to understand concepts and he makes it easy to follow by showing um, the size of black holes over New York City, which is something a lot of people can recognize. Even if you've never been to New York City, you get an idea of how big right. a city can be from that. Um, and so it makes it very relatable because when you're starting to think about objects this size, you just can't really imagine it because they're so massively bigger than anything you've ever seen before. And then when you start, when you start talking about actually a, a, a black hole would only be a few miles across. Um, you don't really think about that because you expect them to be really massive and he explains why that is um but yeah he presents this in such a great way uh as soon as i finished watching it i sent this video to a lot of my space obsessed friends as well me too <laughs> me um, too uh, they all loved it as well and uh, um actually I've, I've subscribed to his channel i need to go back and check out his other videos because i love everything i saw about this and i want to see the rest of his work and i'm going to be very excited for what he's going to talk about next. Um, I think this is going to be great for anyone who wants to learn more about space. And 
you know, anytime a big space movie comes out that talks about things in realis- in you know, realistically, like um say the film Interstellar or The Martian, stuff like this is gonna, you know, teach people who love those movies more about space and it makes it in a way that it's very accessible. Um yes. you know, because there's a lot about space that it can be very a very dry subject if you don't present it well and he does it perfectly. So it's yeah. a great pick. And I I watched the the video talks about talking about how he how he got started. It was a it's kind of a lockdown project he started doing it as well. Uh you know, and that's one of those great things about obviously there's a dark time for the planet, really, but it's one of those things where people try to make the most of it and he obviously did. And it must have been great for, you know, kids who couldn't go to school. When he started putting his videos up, obviously I suspect by the time he started putting videos up, they were going back to school. Right. Imagine having being a kid not being able to go to school but finding this. And this yeah, is the yeah, kind yeah, of content yeah. that, you know, it's perfect for that. Um so yeah, that was really interesting. And the payback where he followed a few tutorials and decided to jump in. That's very relatable because that's how I picked up I claim. <laughs> Mm. Of course, a few basic tutorials about how to make things move around, and then I just dived in, and uh, I thought, well, similar mindset. There. That's my story with with iClone as well. Yeah, my <laughs> intent was okay. I'll start from the beginning and just go through all the tutorials on Realusion's website in order. <laughs> and yeah, I I made it. I probably watched ten, right. <laughs> and then it's like you know. Damn it! I want to get to the real. I'm just going to start, and then when I get stuck, I'll go. Refer- and I did exactly what he describes. Yeah. So yeah, it was very. I found it very relatable. His story. Uh, that's good because I was so impressed by his videos. It made made it relatable for the filmmaking side, and not just the subjects he was talking yes. about. Yes. Um, so yeah, definitely watch that as well because it's very inspiring. Listening to him talking about you know how he did it and uh, you know the motion capture suit that um, he, he's got and. You can see how he's done it, and yeah, it's just very interesting, and it's an excellent pick. I'd say this is probably my favorite pick of the month, uh, this one. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I have a few things to say. Uh, it won't be long, because you guys have pretty much already said what my thoughts are already. Uh, but my first question, uh, by the way, I, it wasn't 10 seconds into the watching the movie that my hit the subscribe button. As fast as I could. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to know more about this. Well, I want to see what this guy was doing. It's that good. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you quickly, Phil, what is machinima or real time about this film? Um, I think that uh, the the way that Blender works now, it's it's... You know, you're working in a real time environment to develop the film. Yeah, it's rendered out a frame at a time, but so is iClone. So was Movie Storm. So is GTA. So it's, I think the definition now is, you know, in the origins of Machinima, it was the actual footage was captured in real time in some way, right? Okay. And then, and then edited together. And, you know, ever since the, the, Tools like when iClone came out, and then Movie Storm, and and then Blender made its change from a Pixar slash RenderMan editor, you know, the, the traditional 3D animation, uh, to something that could render the working environment in real time and be pretty okay. close to the visual fidelity of the finished product. Now, if you if you had the scene that he's got open in Blender and hit play you know, to, to watch it, it'll probably stutter some on a, on all but a really, really good computer. I got it. When it comes to render time, it takes its time and actually renders a frame at a time. iClone works exactly the same way. So I it's it's a it's a very valid question, but I think uh that it's it's real time in the same sense that the other tools, Unreal Engine and uh and iClone and those are as well in Unity. For okay. That. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to be clear on that one. Sure. Because I know some of the people watching this might be wondering about that too, if it was mm-hmm. made in Blender. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, Lisa and I, my wife, went out for the first time in many years, uh, probably because of the COVID thing, 
to an actual theater to watch a actual movie in a big theater. And we watched Dune 2 and we watched Love Lies Bleeding, uh, both of which were fantastic. And I was reminded of that experience of scale. We're so used to every day seeing things on our laptop monitor or maybe our large monitor that that's the mode that we interact most. Yes. But there's something very special about being in a theater that you just can't get around. And I understand why people like David Lynch and others are so passionate about that experience. Well, it occurred to me after watching this movie that his film is so well made and so good and so visually interesting that it would work on a giant screen. Hmm. That you could screen this in a theater and it would be even more impressive. In IMAX even, yeah. Yes, yeah. even in IMAX. Absolutely. Because it's that good. Seriously, his chops, his his ability to be able to create visualizations of what he imagines are concepts, and contrast this with the film we did last week, the Fowl Ferdinand film, um, Dog Days, where so much of that film was a mirror to the viewer, Unlike that, this is a clear presentation of facts, but some facts that are speculative. And he had to use his imagination to figure out how to do it. And his imagination is so good, and he is so convivial and amiable about and, and astonished. He has this astonishment as a narrator at the scale and the quality uh, and the effect of black holes in the universe, that at times it's even comic. For example, you mentioned that he's putting himself inside of his own film, so he's very good. But sometimes it's funny. Like, he talks about, black, and I learned more about black holes than anything I have read in the last 20 years with this short film. Me too. <laughs> but at the event horizon, there's this weird phenomena where even light gets drawn into the, And so as the astronaut, he goes inside of the black hole. And of course, he's turned into this sort of elongated light. And he goes around and round. Um, I kind of I wished he would have done a little wee in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was funny to me. And I thought, here you have this educational film that's talking about a concept that's hard even for scientists, and he's making it fun and interesting, and you can't ask for more than that of a popular science presentation. Um, I have a feeling that he is going to be so good. No wonder that he's got millions of views. No wonder he's got 200,000, over 200,000 subscribers. Um, I have a feeling a major company like Amazon or Netflix or Discovery Channel or Science Channel are going to see, come across his work and approach him and fund him. I think he's, and it'll be a, a challenge for him because I think he's going to have to determine, well, how much influence do I want to, to, to give away? How much control right. do I want to give away? for the content and the subjects that I'm doing, because I'm sure he's passionate about some things, but not as passionate about others. So it'll be, but I predict that's what's going to happen with him. Mm. But it, it's a fa fascinating film that will entertain and educate you at the same time. Now, the second thing, the little uh, uh, short that he did about himself was f also fascinating as well. And it gave me a respect for him because you'd think a man Call, who calls himself Epic Space Man, would do a backgrounder set in space, right? Set on another planet. No. He's got a little, probably a, a cell phone on an extending thing so he can picture himself. He's going down a beautiful little hill that's grass-covered and foresty while he's talking to you. He's coming down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he's a little breathless while he's doing that. It, it gives you a sense of him not only being in tune with science, but in tune with nature as well. Fascinating with nature. 
And in it, he talks about it. You guys have pointed out some of his uh, experiences with Blender. And the quote that he has is, learn enough to not feel overwhelmed, mm -hmm. then start that project you wanted to create. I think that's a perfect, perfect way to approach doing Blender. And his choice of using Blender, I think, was fascinating because Blender is a community-driven project. It's not a closed development process. It's open source, which is a very different kind of beast than Autodesk or any of the other major companies like 3D Studio Max or, or excuse me, uh, Cinema 4D. They're great. They make wonderful things, but they're a closed process. The fact that he chose Blender, I think, is another exemplar of the kind of person he is. He wants people, he wants to learn from other people, he wants to share with other people. And I think some of the things that he did in Blender were just, frankly, I've never seen anybody in the Blender community do. And that's saying a lot. I'll I'll go a step further, Ricky, and say that there are things in his in this video that are more impressive to me than anything that I've seen in the official Blender Foundation demo videos, which are supposed to be cream of the crop. And they are, they're good. Don't get they're me wrong. Fantastic, it's, yeah. It's that this is so much more impactful, I think, uh, yeah. than, you know, than the what was the one? The obese bunny was it for a year, and then something else uh, with yeah. uh, the, the the stylized characters in a a ruin of some kind. And they're great; they're beautiful stuff. But it's like, dude, this this is just this is beyond. Amazing. It. This yeah. is a person, yeah. one person, not yeah. some team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a great Very advertisement impressive. for Blender. If if I mean, they should be putting this out there. As, they absolutely should. Look they should. What you can do with Blender. Yeah, a, a profile of him. They should make him. An honorary god in the community is so extraordinary. <laughs> I, I want to. There is one thing I will will add to my comments. Sure. Um, and and uh, you know th th this is not this is not really to be massively critical, but I was thinking if if he is aiming for this to be educational, I think there also needs to be somewhere where the source material that he's using is listed. Um. Because, you know, at the moment, what, what we've got here is somebody that's coming over as a scientist, but who is not a scientist. And I think, you you know, when you when you're you, when you take on the, the persona of, of, of being a scientist, you have to have at the back of you fact or as fact as you understand it. And I think just to, you know, just to sort of round out what he's portraying here it's clear you know because he showed on on the, this who is he video he showed a spreadsheet and if you looked at the spreadsheet he got lists of information data that he clearly gathered from source material but nowhere does he cite what the source material is and i would i would encourage him to just add that source material because it just gives a you know another layer of yeah i've done my research that's a great suggestion. Don't need yeah. to be actually, a you know. And actually, he, here. Doesn't, he he doesn't have to redo the video to do that either. No, not because, at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, YouTube provides a very generous amount of space in the description. Yeah. Uh, because not everybody that watches the video is going to want to see that, right? No, absolutely. But, but and, it should be there for those who do. Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That would truly make this a bona fide uh, uh, educational resource it if would. there was a bibliography of sorts, you know, yes. annotated list. And the cool thing is you could have links in the description of YouTube. So it wouldn't have, it wouldn't be just bibliography. He could actually have links to source material where appropriate and stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that would be very smart of him to do. Um, and if he doesn't want to do that himself, uh, you know, hopefully he, if, if he generates enough revenue through the channel, he could uh, afford to hire somebody that, that that's their thing. And, spend a few minutes on each video doing that, you know, organizing his, cause you're like you said, Tracy, he's probably got the source materials there, Yeah. but there's an organization and a refinement process to making it into a presentable, just like there is when writing a paper and you need to do the bibliography. Indeed. There's, exactly. Indeed. there's just some organization involved and he could have somebody do that for him. But no, I agree. That would be a great enhancement. 
to this. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's better in the description than actually in the video because, like yeah. you said, the links. You can't yes. link in the actual video itself. That's right. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, but I do think it would just add another uh, another layer to it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and finally, I'd like to say that this is one of the greatest machinima films I have ever seen. It's that good. Yeah, I guarantee you, if you watch this film, you will subscribe, you will learn, you will be entertained, you will laugh, you will come away wanting to know more about the subject. You can't ask for better storytelling than that. And I slightly disagree with you, Damien. I think nonfiction, uh, documentary, or science films are storytellers as well. They're just yeah. telling a different kind of story. But you know what I mean, though. The the we're using a this is a factual situation, and usually that doesn't apply to a lot of uh, machinima films. So that you know they're either doing something like Red versus Blue, which is kind of silly comedy stuff, or they're doing dramatic stories. But not a lot of thought is necessary spent into um, making sure it's all uh, scientifically accurate or accurate to the real world. They just focus on their story. Whereas this is, of course, taking facts and then making presenting it in a way that um, it's a story, but but I think there's a certain amount, a cert certainly in black hole understanding of black holes, there's a certain amount that can be expressed that's fictional as well, mm. because they're speculating based on the given information. Yep. It's it's just a, it's the creation of a world, but the world is fact fictional, or the world is factual, not yeah. fiction. Well, maybe it's and factional. I Factional, yeah. <laughs> but I think you can use some of the same things, like the rising rising tension to a climax, to a denouement. I think the climax of him being in the center of that supermassive black hole, which just astonished me, uh, it, it is very much like being in a drama, you know. Maybe I'm stretching the point, but no, still. No, I don't think so. I think I think you're right, Ricky. I think it's a re <laughs> this is this film is a reminder that um, there are types of narrative uh, that are still narrative that maybe don't immediately strike us as such because there's not a clear protagonist and antagonist. There's not these these structures that are part of our common narratives of of what we would call stories. But this has a story to it, and I, I mean, if you've ever read or seen the the film. Uh, video version of Stephen Hawking's A History of Space and Time, that is a narrative. Any Carl Sagan documentary, there is a narrative. There is a yes. structure and a story he's telling. Yeah. It's just that it's not Joe or Jane and the evil warlord, <laughs> you know. It's not Slay the Dragon type of story. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but there is narrative structure there, and and that information does not inherently have that narrative structure. I think that's what you were trying to get at, Ricky, is that Thank this you. information isn't this interesting. It's just not. It's a spreadsheet, you know, but how he presented it, how he structured it, there is a an arc to what an I mean, build up to what he's doing. Yeah, that's beautiful. And 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 it is a it's a great reminder that that uh this is a type of narrative that's very, very effective. It's yeah. a story. Let's call it that. It yeah. is a story. There's just no hero or villain. Yeah. But it's a story for sure. <laughs> well, I think the black hole could be a villain. Black hole could be a villain. It's yeah. eating God. everything. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed your pick, Phil. It was just enlightening and, and it just made my whole day. The whole day after watching it, I was thinking about it and checking things and oh i have other projects i'm i'm working on so it was so hard to steer myself away wanting to dive into this <laughs> this subject and this guy i had to stay on my own stuff but it was marvelous if you have thoughts or feelings uh you want to share with us uh or if you're epic spaceman and you hear about this contact us at talk at completely machinima.com we'd love to hear it and thank you, Phil, for making this pick. And thanks, Damien and Tracy, for your thoughts and uh, your work, background research on this. Well, that's our show for today. Um, we hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.